Wonderful. Uh, welcome everybody back from the break. Uh, a reminder again that we go by the Creative Commons uh, for uh, freely sharing this material with attribution. And uh, my name is Atabota, and I'm uh, running module six on WGS based subtyping. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, this is me. Uh, I'm with uh, Public Health Agency of Canada at uh, National Microbiology in Winnipeg, uh, where I run the Genomic Epidemiology Research Unit. And we do primarily research and methods development uh, for uh, genomic epi of bacterial foodborne uh, pathogens. But first, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, that I'm coming to you from uh, Treaty 1 territory and that Manitoba is located on uh, treaty territories and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, the Dakota Oyate, the Denisulin, and Nehetobic uh, nations. And we acknowledge that Manitoba is located on the homeland of the Red River Metis. So first, uh, learning objectives of the module. Uh, basic introduction to molecular subtyping and its role in uh, molecular epidemiology and surveillance. Uh, then a, a little bit about WGS-based subtyping uh, and how we go from sequencing rates to subtyping. Um, a little bit to cover uh, aspects of analysis, including clustering visualizations and so on. And a little bit about genomic surveillance. Uh, so the, if you've skipped ahead, that there, there's a lot of slides here, but um, a lot of this is just for context and so that uh, if you're bored at home one evening, you can go through this on your own. So epidemiology is the distribution of, ex uh, of exposure to risk factors at the population level and the distribution of uh, disease outcomes. And molecular epi has been around for several decades uh, and focuses on using molecular approaches to characterize infectious agents so that we can try to infer uh, their transmission. The basic paradigm is fairly simple, and you probably know this, um, but uh, if isolates are epidemiologically linked, then they should be genetically uh, identical or very similar. And and re the reverse is also true. Um, if they're not linked, then they should not be similar genetically. Uh, and um, for many years uh, prior to the adoption of, the, of WGS, um, we were de really dealing with attempting to assess similarity in the absence of real genetic data. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, a hundred years ago, we were uh, developing, you know, methods based on things like serotyping or biotyping, uh, and that evolved into methods based on uh, DNA. Uh, you know, a lot of it, you know, running on gels and so on, and that led to this uh, proliferation of methods um, that uh, Mark Atman, who's a renowned Salmonella uh, person. Uh, called the atoms, which is when me uh, methods are being sort of developed uh, and and uh, people would do a little bit of testing and validation and then they would just release the paper and then hope that the wider community in testing would provide additional validation. Now, the, the role of epidemiology and surveillance in all of this is very important. Because at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to link uh, infectious agents um, to potential uh, uh, human clinical cases or animal clinical cases. And it begins with collecting samples from potential sources of exposure, recovering microbial isolates so that we can characterize them, uh, and then comparing the genetic data and identifying potentially matching isolates. Um, and then examining the epidemiology of these matching isolates. Um, and thus we can identify uh, 
case clusters that look like they might be potential outbreaks. And we can also trace back to potential sources of exposure so that we can then implement uh, public health measures to try to contain the cases. Um, in the olden days, um, significant challenges arose from the, the fact that molecular subtyping methods were better than nothing, but they also had a number of weaknesses, especially in terms of estimating genetic similarities, which is the whole point of it, is trying to find matching isolates that are likely to be the, the same strain, if you will. Uh, so with a lot of the molecular subtyping methods, it was very easy to either overestimate or underestimate genetic similarity. Uh, and so that uh, using molecular subtyping data alone was, uh, you know, could be quite problematic. Now, in terms of WGS-based subtyping, what's interesting is that uh, uh, 11 years ago, there was, a, um, a, you know, one of these, uh, um, like, a, a, a pretty important um, meeting uh, it's called IMEM, it's sort of like a molecular epi uh, uh, meeting that's held sort of biannually, and it was held in Paris that time. And this was sort of like right before, you know, big WGS uh, data started to come online. And so at the time, a lot of the discussion centered around, you know, the fact that, okay, you know, we have, um, you know, legacy subtyping data in massive databases that are used for surveillance. And we have some WGS data, but maybe not enough, uh, not enough of a critical mass to be able to just fully replace. Uh, so therefore, a lot of the emphasis at the time, certainly, you know, from uh, among a lot of my peers was uh, trying to develop methods that would um, essentially do in silico versions of the original typing methods, generally by you know, looking for the same uh, uh, genetic determinants that might be involved in the molecular subtype. And then that's when a representative from, from Public Health England announced to the world that they would be sequencing every single salmonella isolate that would be coming through their surveillance programs. And that's, that was unheard of at the time. And that pretty much set the stage for everything that's come since. Because it kind of forced everybody else to up their game too. So in the new paradigm, basically, we're dealing with generating WGS data. We're still, again, trying to estimate genetic similarity. Of course, now we're using whole genome sequence data. And um, depending on how you analyze that data, you're going to get better and better estimates of genetic similarity. Uh, a, a lot of it really centers around concepts of comparative genomics and whether or not you do it, you know, sort of like a, 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 a and, and it really depends on the level of granularity that you can apply uh, to the comparative genomic analysis. Um, but, at, you know, at the end of the day, all of the WGS-based uh, typing is about trying to extract an index uh, see, uh, some form of sequence variation information uh, so that we can then estimate um, genetic similarity at, at a high resolution. But before we can discuss that, we must discuss what came before it. And one of the primary methods um, in the olden days uh, was this method called multilocal sequence typing or MLST. And it's kind of uh, weird, I have to tell you. It's weird for me to be presenting this to you because um, in the olden days, I was not a big fan of MLST for a number of reasons that I'm going to discuss later on. Uh, but so much so that, so the MLST was uh, described by Martin Maiden at Oxford, that at one meeting I actually presented right after Martin where, and but I didn't know this before, you know, it was just one of those things where we got put right ne uh, one after the other. But I would, and I think it was kind of perversely uh, done that way by the organizers, because the whole point of my talk was to trash MLST right after he had talked about MLST. Um, but in any, we've made peace. We, you know, we drank scotch in uh, Gary's uh, office a few years ago. Um, so anyway, MLST involves uh, analyzing seven to nine loci um, 
core genes or housekeeping genes, uh, PCR amplifying them, sequencing them, and then generating these allelic profiles. Um, and I'm going to describe that in, in greater detail. But suffice to say that MLSD sort of became the gold standard um, for molecular epi. Uh, because it replaced that previous generation of methods that were based on comparing gels and fragments and gels and so on, and it replaced it with sequence data, which was quite revolutionary, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, different groups around the world, uh, you know, started developing schema for different uh, organisms to the point that, you know, at the time, you know, there was over 50 different schema that had been developed and used in hundreds of studies. But, and so now this is like the section where I start trashing MLST little by little. Um, so one of the things that's kind of unusual about MLST, um, so my role here is, uh, you know, so if, if we uh, had to, let's say different instructors were had to describe like, oh, tell us about a delicacy, uh, food delicacy in Europe. I'd be the guy stuck talking about haggis. Um, so MLST is, isn't technically a proper phylogenetic analysis, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so if we, you know, in the olden days, we, you know, before, you know, whole genome sequence data, you might perform phylogenetic analysis by uh, amplifying a particular gene. And then you would perform phylogenetic analysis of that sequence data for that one gene uh, in the manner that uh, Fiona described. Uh, so as I mentioned, MLST involves seven genes. You could, and certainly people do some of this, they have done this in the past, take the sequence data of these seven genes, concatenate it, and then analyze it using a proper phylogenetic framework. Um, which, you know, involves using an evolutionary model of sequence evolution and so on. Uh, but actual MLST analysis involves nothing of that. So in MLST, we have seven genes. We generate the sequence data, but then we collapse that down to the allele number. So each different allele gets an allele number. So therefore, the collection of seven allele numbers, that becomes the profile. Uh, and basically, that's what we analyze, is how similar profiles are at seven points. Oh, and, and you know, because we're not really dealing with sequence data anymore, we're just literally comparing the similarity at seven data points. That's MLST. Um, so, um, you know, not a big fan when this was first, uh, you know, when I was coming up uh, and raging against the world. Um, so uh, why MLST became as popular as it was sort of take, requires a little bit of a detour into areas that were, have been sort of covered in some of the earlier uh, lectures. Uh, and they deal primarily with this whole concept of uh, mutation and recombination in phylogenetic analysis. And it's, this has been alluded to. Um, so phylogenetic analysis, uh, you know, one of the sort of major assumptions um, is that sequences are evolving via a, accumulation of mutations. Uh, however, in a lot of microbial species, not just microbial species, but I mean, microbial species sort of have refined this uh, or made it an art. Uh, recombination becomes a thing that is quite prominent uh, depending on the species. Um, so in uh, with recombination, then you, you can have an influx of genetic data that's coming in laterally. And that sort of violates that assumption of vertical transmission and mutations. Um, so because of this, it can distort phylogenetic signal. Um, so different species will have different sort of population structures and everything from, uh, what's 
traditionally called clonal, which is primarily vertical descent, um, to something that's weakly clonal, and I'll explain that brief, uh, in a subsequent slide, to what's called epidemic, and this uh, state called panmixia, where it's just a free-for-all of recombinational exchange. Um, and microbial populations are generally, you know, sort of depending on the species, they can be composed of different sublineages of the population that some of which behave in some of, you know, the, some of these different manners. You know, you may have certain sublineages of the population that are primarily highly clonal, whereas others are highly recombinational. And, you know, and it's because of the biology, the underlying biology uh, of the different strains um, that there are certain mechanisms that certain strains have that other strains don't have uh, that prevent, uh, uh, you know, or that, that largely curtail lateral uh, acquisition of DNA. And so because of this, you know, populations are a bit of a mishmash of things. Um, so, you know, so again, you know, recombination and, and mutation vary by species. Uh, but again, we know that uh, recombination uh, ultimately uh, kind of ruins uh, nice evolutionary uh, analysis. So, so much so that you have to develop methodologies to try and screen that out before you can analyze data. So there are programs that have been developed precisely to, you know, to try to identify areas where that, you know, that are likely to be due to recombination so that that can get removed. So the other thing, and this is, you know, about pathogens is that uh, they sh exhibit this epidemic structure uh, that was uh, described by uh, Maynard Smith, uh, where there is a lot of rare subtypes that are in rare circulation and that are freely ex uh, exchanging uh, genetic uh, material through recombination. At the same time, now and then there are distinct clones or strains that sort of take off uh, and th that are more likely to exhibit this tree-like evolutionary, uh, um, you know, descent. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a bit of a, a mix, you know, but these sort of, uh, you know, these cones, these tornadoes are the clonal complexes that expand in time and that disproportionately contribute uh, to disease. Uh, so th because of that, you know, a lot of the emphasis really has to be, um, so although, you know, the, ro uh, the goal of evolutionary tr evolutionarily tracing everybody and analyzing a population in the proper fashion is important, uh, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you have to recognize that, uh, you know, from a public health perspective, what's important is just finding these clones and being able to analyze these clones. And uh, and I guess the other thing too is analysis within the clones is a lot easier. Between clones is where things get more complicated. And so, you know, in, in you know, in for the sake of pragmatism, then analyzing at the clone level might be, you know, might be left to more sort of evolutionarily aware methods. Uh, and that when we're trying to deal with surveillance data, maybe you have to make some compromises. And I would argue that MLST is one such compromise. So getting back to this, um, you know, which is kind of weird, you know, you collapsing all this information down to seven data points. Um, the, uh, in terms of uh, MLST analysis itself, one of the sort of one of the important uh, concepts was the development of this uh, burst algorithm, um, which is essentially trying to uh, adapt the epidemic clone model to the analysis of MLST data. Um, so the original burst uh, algorithm was then replaced by eBurst, uh, and then eBurst was replaced by uh, a new version called Go eBurst, uh, but it essentially is all about trying to find, uh, you know, so you know how I was talking about, um, you know, clones or, you know, clonal complexes. Uh, 
basically in a Cuomo complex, you try, or in burst analysis, you try to find these guys in red who are sort of like the founding type of the Cuomo complex. And then everybody else uh, who is a sort of like a descendant of that progenitor. And they evolve the stepwise acquisition of novel alleles uh, by acquiring single, double, and triple uh, changes uh, in alleles, primarily through recombination, but not always, also by mutation. Um, and uh, and clonal complex complexes are essentially based on that model of the progenitor and sort of a cloud of guys who are sort of related to them. And burst analysis will produce, you know, um, they will produce uh, what definitely doesn't look like a tree phylogeny, uh, but, uh, um, but it is sort of like the visual representation of all these clones uh, that are not really connected, but uh, except by the fact that we know that they're all from the same species. So, uh, so for species with an epidemic uh, population structure, you know, MLST and Everst are, you know, they, they made that type of analysis possible. Um, MLST has a, a nomenclature, and it was probably one of the first methods that had sort of like a systematic way of approaching nomenclature, which is a really important concept in genomic surveillance, well, and surveillance, microbial surveillance, but certainly genomic surveillance as well. And I'll try to describe that via this table. So as you see in this table, that there's seven genes that are shown here. Uh, and then there is a sequence type and there's a clonal complex. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this particular sequence type has allele number one at the gene called TKT. Um, this entire uh, you know, series of seven integers becomes the allelic profile. And in this case, it's called ST21, sequence type 21. Uh, this guy has a one uh, allele variation compared to ST21, and thus it's called a single locus variant of ST21 uh, because it has this allele 12 instead of allele one at uh, the gene called GLT. This guy's a double locus variant because uh, it has two allelic replacements. And this entire thing is called clonal complex SD21. And it is, uh, it comprises a bunch of different sequence types that are all really closely related to, uh, to the founder, which is sequence type 21. That's why the clonal complex is called SD21. Uh, and they're all, they all differ by at most three allele differences. So single locus variance, double locus variance, triple locus variance, they all go in the same clonal complex. And this concept of a nomenclature is important because uh, A, it represents a systematic approach to naming things. Um, you know, these genetic lineages and their sublineages are given a very specific name and everybody can agree what that means. It also makes the method portable because uh, once we've established uh, you know, these rules and we implement them. And if we have a database that everyone can access, we are all talking the same language. Uh, but as I said, you know, I have, I have problems with MLS too. The first one is that, th you know, this tree uh, is based on a whole bunch of strains that by MLST using seven genes, they're identical. And it's, you know, it's kind of, Funny in a way, uh, thinking back uh, to the great pronouncements that were made on uh, based on MLST data, you know, seven data points, and people talking about this strain or this clonal complex as if it, you know. So on the basis of seven data points in the genome, you're like, oh, yeah, these two strains are identical. Uh, but, you know, yet if you only had the whole genome sequence data for them, you would soon see that they are nowhere near identical, that there's a lot of differences between them. So seven genes, right? And, you know, a typical genome might contain several thousand genes. Um, and at the same time, you know, you have this issue with, because of the 
small number of data points, uh, your databases start, con you know, they start collapsing down to a small number of highly prevalent sequence types, Ma essentially making a any sort of epidemiological analysis really difficult. Um, so MLST was really good for long-term tracking of lineages, but even the ardent, most ardent defender of MLST, and I'm not one of them, uh, would say that the, it lacks sufficient power for things like outbreak investigations. So it was never really used for that, ever. Uh, now, now that we have whole genome sequence data, uh, you know, the whole thought of trying to apply MLST at the genome scale le level sort of was a very attractive proposition uh, because we already have an overall approach for dealing with the data. We already have databases and so on. So um, why not just apply MLST at the genome scale? Um, and especially given the fact that once you break it down, and especially uh, more recently, now that we have, you know, so we've gone through several iterations of high throughput sequencing, the newest, um, you know, the newest platforms uh, can generate genome sequence data at such a, you know, at a, such a low price point that right now it would be cheaper to generate whole genome sequence data for an isolate than to perform old school MLST by doing PCR and then sequencing of the seven individual loci. So scaling up MLST became a thing, right? So then can't we just do this MLST, but using every, all of the genes? And the, it's not that simple. So now I'm gonna tell you why. So the first problem is, and this was has been a point that's been touched upon earlier, is the whole concept of core genes versus accessory genes. So most species um, have uh, what we call a pangenome comprising core genes that everybody has and a set of accessory genes, which is a wider cloud of genes from which the uh, any given uh, isolate will draw from. Um, so you'll have a certain proportion of your genome that is core, everybody has it, and everything else is a, you know, a collection of accessory genes, primarily, uh, you know, that tailor you to your environment. Um, so, and this whole thing we call a pangenome, and across the me many members of the species, that's the pangenome. The collection of the core and the entire cloud of accessory genes available to the species. But in the context of MLST, accessory genes are a huge pain in the ass because we don't know whether or not a particular gene should be found in a particular strain. That's the thing that makes them accessory. Different strains will carry different complements of these accessory genes. So we just don't know if a particular gene, uh, accessory gene should be there or not. Uh, we've also talked about genome assemblies and, uh, you know, although, you know, you're familiar with the fact that you can have a reference genome uh, that you can map your reads to. And so it's a reference guided assembly. In a lot of cases, we're doing de novo assembly because it's simply not possible to have, you know, a reference genome for every single, you know, set of strains that you have sequence data for. Uh, and once you start doing de novo assembly, you're going to run into gaps uh, in the assembly, you know, where you're going to have multiple contigs and then gaps of unknown length. Um, and the problem then becomes that if you have uh, a gap in the assembly, if there happens to be a locus that lies in the same area where the assembly gap occurs, that means that you can't do anything about that locus. That locus it, uh, becomes unassignable. So going back again to the issue of accessory genes, we, you know, if uh, we analyze allelic data for a particular strain and we have a whole bunch of accessory genes, we won't know whether or not the gene is not there 
because the gene is not supposed to be there because it's an accessory, or if it is core, but missing from your assembly because of an assembly gap. And this gets worse and worse as you start sequencing more and more genomes, and if you start adding more and more loci. Um, so therefore, for all intents and purposes, you know, you can't really escape missing data. The best you can do is to try to avoid as much of it as you can for reasons that I'm going to explain later. Uh, so you're going to have to sacrifice some genomes or some loci in the, for the sake of quality control. Um, this is a, yet another one, and this is something that, uh, that Fiona brought up, um, the whole concept of paralogs and orthologs. Um, and in terms of MLST, what, you know, the issue, and it's something that Fiona also brought up, is the fact that ideally you're comparing ortholog to ortholog. Because if you compare paralogs, they may no longer be, well, they're no longer doing the same thing anymore. You know, because genes duplicate and then they evolve separately as they start, you know, uh, branching out to diversify to accomplish different roles in the cell. Uh, so comparison of paralogs is not really apples to apples anymore. Uh, but if you have duplicated genes in the genome, establishing orthology can be uh, can be tricky. Uh, and certainly uh, Fiona's group, they've developed uh, uh, computational approaches to tackle that. Uh, but suffice to say that the reason these computational approaches, sophisticated computational approaches are necessary is that it's a tricky problem. Um, so th this is yet another one that wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be so obvious is that some genes show significant variation in, in sequence and in length. Um, and so this is just a hypothetical scenario where, um, you know, certain alleles, you know, are uh, in terms of, uh, sequence identity are down to 83%. And now you're starting to wonder, is this really the same gene anymore or the same ortholog? Uh, and at the same time, allele four, uh, we are not 100% sure. It's the one that sticks out uh, that, that its start position in terms of the coding sequence is quite different from everybody else. And this is fine if you're dealing with a handful of alleles. But as you start generating data on thousands of isolates, these types of things start destroying what it, you know, what a particular locus definition becomes. Um, so because of that, you know, there are certain genes that, you know, even though they are core, because of the, you know, the heterogeneity in sequence and the variability in start codon position, they become tricky to incorporate. And so it's almost better just to avoid low cell like that. Uh, because uh, on, a, on a large enough data set, um, you know, these strange alleles start to become a problem. So that's why we end up at core genome MLST. So in, in core genome MLST, we focus on core genes. Uh, and this solves uh, several problems uh, to deal with the fact that, you know, in the olden days, MLST was hand curated by artisan MLST purveyors that would, you know, you would submit them. So whenever you found a new allele, you would send them your trace files and they would manually curate it and say like, oh yeah, this is indeed a novel allele. So let's enter it into the database by hand. Uh, that's not gonna happen with whole genome sequence data and thousands of loci and thousands of strains. Um, so because that level of curation is not really feasible, that you know makes kind of forces you to try to do as much work up front uh, to make things work right off right out of the box. Um, so the reason CGMLST has been proposed as an approach is that a as discussed above, you know the core genes are shared by all members of the species, so they should be present. If you don't find them, there's something wrong with your assembly. At the same time. Uh, most core genes uh, will evolve by the acquisition of, uh, of SNV level variation. 
So therefore, uh, A, it makes it easier to find uh, these genes by homology searching. Um, and, um, you know, and at the same time, you know, the issues like uh, the length, variation, and so on, uh, doesn't become too, too problematic. So in terms of uh, acting as a foundation for applying MLST to the genome scale, CGMLST is the way to go. Now, in the olden days, and I've been at this for 15 years or so, uh, you had to design schema by hand. So um, you kind of had to have a whole bunch of genome sequence data, then you'd have to... Now, thankfully, uh, software to do pangenome analysis has been available for a while. But you'd have to do a pangenome pen gen analysis, identify core genes, and then manually go through the process of assessing whether or not the core genes uh, had a lot of the criteria that we're looking for. And I'm going to describe these in a sec. So, the, uh, however, you know, at, at the same time, I'll bring up this program called Trubaca because it was developed by our colleagues, uh, uh, Joao Corriso um, and friends at the uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, so Chewbacca does a number of things. So what, uh, aside from, so Chewbacca, I can't remember if it does sort of like a, you know, pseudo pan genome analysis or if it requires, uh, you know, sort of like pan genome uh, output files from something like Rory and or so, so on. But, but in any case, once you, you know, it will go through the data, try to find your core, and then it starts looking for the, you know, the loci that tend to be problematic. So, you know, the, those genomes that have length variability, the genomes that appear to be duplicated um, uh, or that might be paralogous, it will go through all of that and start eliminating problematic genes so that it gets not only to the core, but the high quality core, you know, the loci in the core that are most likely to behave nicely uh, once we apply them to the analysis of thousands of genomes. Uh, and, it, you know, and it does another thing, you know, so it, it generates a schema, but then it also will evaluate the schema. And then once it's in place, then it actually also works as an allele caller. So it's, uh, so it's a really good program. It, it's a little bit finicky because it was, you know, not that, um, it was developed by, you know, or the code was developed by folks who were new to coding. Uh, and so like grad students who learned to code as they were, building Chewbacca. So, you know, that's going to have impact on things. But uh, but anyway, the whole point is that something like Chewbacca then, you know, helps to standardize the development of CGMLSD schema. Uh, you know, and the other, you know, the, I've, it's an, incredible to me that uh, at this day and age, uh, I see uh, CGMLSD schema that look like they have accessory genes um, or else they may be too small and it looks like they've maybe been a little bit too aggressive in terms of getting rid of accessory genes that maybe some of their accessory are not truly accessory. Um, and at the same time, it's really important that when you're developing a schema that you use enough of a breadth of sampling of the population so that the core and accessory assignment is robust. Um, so anyway, I, again, like I've seen core load, uh, sorry, CGMLSD schema that include genes uh, or core genes that are present in 95% of the genomes, and that's just not a core gene. Um, and, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, sometimes you just have to agree to drop certain loci or some genomes uh, because it's better to have less data, but that is better quality data. In terms of CGMLST, we, you know, we talked about the fact that, um, you know, we kind of need to identify clones and we, uh, so now one of the things is, um, again, we're not doing like a proper phylogenetic analysis because we have we're collapsing every allele down to a number. Uh, so even though we're we may be dealing with a thousand loci, we're still not using the sequence data itself 
we are collapsing every allelic variant into a number. Um, so to compute the similarity between profiles, we use the Hamming distance, which is just the number of agreements and disagreements uh, between two profiles. And then once you, uh, you know, so basically you take, uh, uh, you, you generate a matrix of pairwise uh, distances or similarities, and that matrix you can then put through uh, any hierarchical cl uh, clustering algorithm. Um, often, um, you know, you use average linkage or single linkage and so on. Uh, I think in our um, lab, I think we've used uh, complete linkage uh, clustering. Um, and again, like this, uh, the, the aim here is not phylogenetically correct, uh, phylogenetic correctness because such thing can't exist with an LST. We're just trying to get robust clusters and sort of interlineage relationships on the whole. Now, I also, um, you know, I should talk about spanning trees. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, a whole bunch of, this, I'm going to get to the point of all of this. Because it's not like I, I'm, I, I, I don't know every step in this algorithm. Um, but, am, but these are sort of like the steps required to get from, um, you know, from data to a minimum spanning tree, which is a way of displaying relationships uh, between uh, between strains um, in a in a in a tree like structure that minimizes the number the length of the different edges or connections between uh, you know between different leaves and the reason the reason I went through MSTs is that ultimately eburst is a, a variant of MST building. Um, and so again, I mentioned this Go Eberst that was meant that was sort of like a an improvement on Eberst. And then a uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was uh, actually these are folks from uh, Mark Atman, Yadam guy, Salmonella guy, that developed uh, this algorithm that is sort of like an implementation of uh, Go Eberst for genome scales, and it. Uh, it is sort of like the go-to, uh, it's my uh, preferred, uh, because it can tolerate certain levels of missing data. And uh, it is, and the, its uh, approach for identifying sort of the founders in clonal complexes is uh, based on, on sort of go Ebers principles. Now, when you're trying to interpret uh, CGMLS2 data in the context of epidemiology. Uh, I'm a big believer in generating genomic clusters from whole genome sequence data. And this is generally uh, generated through the application of distance thresholds. So before we talk about that, uh, we're going to do a bit of an aside on thresholds and so on. So there's the apocryphal story that um, that Charles Darwin, uh, in one uh, letter to one of his colleagues, talked about the concept of splitters and lumpers. Uh, you know, and this whole concept of it's better to split things, uh, right? And say like, oh, this is a separate species from that. Or to say like, well, those guys are similar enough. We should lump them. Um, and when you're talking about whole genome sequence data and thousands of, um, you know, genomes, Ultimately, you're going to have to create clusters and for a reason that I'm going to give you in a sec. Uh, but the whole point of it, you know, of this is that you generally have to do some sort of thresholding so that you can uh, generate different clusters. And in this particular cartoon, I'm showing how the application of four different thresholds generates two different, uh, you know, two different sets of clusters. Uh, generally, as you get you know, as you approach a distance of zero allelic differences, you're gonna generate smaller clusters. Uh, and as you move further away from zero allele differences, you're gonna ge generate larger clusters. And, you know, you figuring out the optimum sweet spot for this is a bit of an, an art. Um, so generally, you know, when, when people have been doing this in the context of epidemiology, a lot of the work has been, uh, has been based on the the approach of 
taking outbreak data and then trying to develop thresholds that make the outbreaks work. Um, so empirically determined based on outbreak data. But, you know, knowing that there's a, you know, a universe of possible, uh, you know, solutions to this problem, you know, ultimately, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, we have a lot of information to inform uh, proper uh, thresholds. Uh, and it should include, uh, you know, things like estimating whether or not certain thresholds capture things like, you know, shared environmental niche uh, or, you know, are more likely to capture, you know, common descent and so on and so forth. Um, because ultimately what we, what we do know is that ecology, epidemiology and population genetics are all interlinked. So all of these things should be contributing to the development of these thresholds. Okay, so getting back here, uh, distance thresholds, huh? you know, the, the process that I, I um, refer to as cluster extraction is where you can apply a distance threshold so that you can output clusters of genomes that are related at a particular level of similarity. Uh, and that's super important because once you have those clusters, you can start analyzing them for covariates of interest. Um, so, um, you know, so we, we always have genome sequence data and we have metadata for those genomes. And basically any metadata variable and its subcategories can be used as a covariate that you can start investigating the level of, of that particular variant across the various genomic clusters at that particular threshold. That's super powerful. Um, one of the things that I've done in this particular radial tree is that I've taken cluster information and then within, for each cluster, I've computed the percentage of human clinical isolates and the percentage of resistance to a particular antibiotic. And then I've mapped that back to the tree so that you can, you can see the areas of the tree where there are hotspots of, you know, of strains that uh, are likely to cause disease or that are likely to carry AMR. Now, one of the, this is sort of like textbook um, sort of uh, outbreak analysis, uh, and, you know, and it, it's, it really relies ultimately on looking at the intersection between, you know, sort of like what and the epidemiological investigation is telling you, for, uh, you know, based on, you know, on interviewing patients, uh, potential common exposures, uh, and then trying to look at the information on those genomes, those isolates, and seeing whether or not uh, there's any correlations to the to to your potential outbreak. Um, so for something like a point source outbreak, uh, you know, where everybody went to the picnic and some people ate the potato salad and it mayonnaise was off, um, they'll all be exposed to the same thing. And it's very probable that they, you know, their strains are gonna look very similar at the genomic level. And that also their metadata information in terms of the date of isolation, the location of isolation, and other metadata variables collected, you know, through the epidemiological interview process, uh, they're going to be all sort of concordant with the outbreak. However, many outbreaks don't fit this mold. And at the same, at the same time, you know, and, and it goes without saying, like it's one thing to do this, like here, you know, where in a, a small data set. But imagine if you have ten thousand genomes in a database. Uh, are you really going to be doing that, uh, you know, sort of like at the manual level, going through the tree and looking for, see if the metadata variables are mapping with clusters? Probably not. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about some novel approaches, because MLST, you know, it's one thing, but it's not everything. The one I'm going to talk about is MASH, and because I think it's a really clever approach. Uh, so it uses this algorithm called MinHash, which is uh, sort of based on using, you know, k-mers. Like the particulars 
uh, of the, the, you know, so you start with the genome, you take it apart into its component cameras, and there's an algorithm that gets you from all of the cameras that were produced down to a set, a smaller set of cameras. And then the comparison between strains occurs at that level on what's cal called a sketch, uh, which is the, that subset of, of cameras that we're using for the comparison. And at that point now, you know, that we're, it's no different than MLST. We're comparing the camera sketches on the basis of the individual cameras and how many are, you know, are shared between the two. And you generate a distance and away you go. Now, the thing that's really amazing about this is that when this was originally described, it was announced that, uh, at a, well, the first time I saw it was at a meeting in Portugal, again, one of these IMEM molecular epi meetings, where um, the group that had developed this essentially used it to show that it, you could that you could use MASH to analyze all of the genomes in RefSeq at NCBI, uh, the, the short read archive, uh, and you could cluster something like 50,000 different species to recapitulate at phylogenetic, well, to recapitulate a dendrogram that looked an awful lot like what you might uh, see if you were doing like a tr proper tree of life type of reconstruction. It's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that's kind of neat about MASH is that you don't, you know, that you can, because you're using cameras, you can input uh, genome assemblies, metagenomic data, just nucleotide sequences, raw sequencing reads, and it can all, it can munch it all. We're, we're almost at the end here. So I mentioned that CGMLST is not the greatest when it comes to, uh, this, you know, to the res resolution or discriminatory power. Um, especially, you know, because we've had to toss away all these accessory genes that can represent a significant proportion of the genome. Uh, so ultimately, we've sacrificed uh, discriminatory power for robustness in going only with core genes. And sometimes that's just not enough power for what you're trying to accomplish. So you need to come up with alternative solutions. One solution is that you can now focus your SNF-based analysis. Once you've established uh, that you're dealing with a genomic cluster of similar genomes um, based on CGMLST, now you can dive in and you can perform SNF-based analysis because you're going to be able to, uh, you know, to take one of these genomes as the reference and you can map to all of those, generate your SNVs, and so on. The other possibility is to see whether or not, uh, you know, you can start using some of the accessory loci. Uh, accessory loci are problematic at the species level because any particular genome may or may can, may or may not contain that accessory uh, locus. But within a subpopulation, more often than not, they share very, very similar accessory genome content. So that gives you more, more loci that you could add to the analysis if you want to go that way. But personally, probably SNVs are way better. Uh, the other consideration is that you're now we're dealing with sort of global databases, um, and <clears throat> and um, part of the whole um, allure of MLST is the fact that you can have a centralized database uh, where you know new alleles are being defined and where novel sequence types are being defined. But part of the problem is that a lot of people do their analysis locally, and so then, um, you know, so if you do your analysis locally, at what point do you share your data with the international community or the international database so that we can reconcile? Uh, and one, I thought, fairly clever uh, way of trying to uh, sidestep this problem is what's been called hash CGMLST. Normally, you know, when a novel allele is defined, you, you do it by querying the allele database. And if it's never been seen before, you just take 
you know, let's say we have, oh, we have 900 existing alleles. Our new allele then is called 901. In, uh, in hash CGMLST, what you do is when you have the sequence data, you put it what's called uh, through a, what's called a hashing function, at, which generates a unique integer based on the sequence data. And so therefore the sequence data itself carries a number based on the sequence. And so therefore there's no assignment required because it's the hashing function that's assigning the name. I talked about nomenclatures and prior to COVID, nomenclatures were kind of like one of those arcane little things that some people like myself were quite interested in, uh, but not necessarily everybody. Uh, but certainly in the, in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, one of the major accomplishments was the fact that there was a development of a nomenclature for naming you know, the various uh, sequences and assigning them into clades uh, and sort of doing it in an algorithmic fashion by implementing a number of different rules uh, into a subtyping system. Um, and the, the thing about nomenclatures that is super important is that it, you know, it gives everybody a family, like, oh, I have a sequence, what is it? Um, oh, it belongs to this particular family. You know, when we started talking about the various variants, well, that's what these were. That was the nomenclature. Of course, you know, the original nomenclature was like A dot B, but, you know, and then we started like, okay, you know what? That's too complicated for humans. Let's just call it, you know, Omicron. Um, but, at, you know, the underlying of Omicron was an, a more complicated or more complex nomenclature that was assigned by the nomenclature software. And, uh, and another important thing, uh, you know, and we've talked about privacy concerns and sometimes whole genome sequence data is not necessarily freely shareable. Uh, but knowing that you have a genome of this particular subtype is enough for someone else to be able to, uh, you know, start their investigation. Uh, in terms of microbial uh, surveillance, some nomenclatures have been proposed for various bugs. And they all have the same sort of concept behind it, is the idea of developing sort of a hierarchical system of levels of similarity uh, so that, you know, so that it's almost kind of like an IP address. Um, now, in terms of, you know, sort of a recap of uh, genomic epi, uh, starts with isolation, sequencing, indexing the variation, and so on and so forth, but ends with the integration with epi metadata and trying to interpret what's going on with a genomic cluster. And that's the point where, you know, whole genome sequence data actually can impact uh, what's happening at the public health level. So I'll just leave you with some parting thoughts. Um, you know, the gold standard ultimately is phylogenetic analysis. Um, but sometimes it's not, you know, it's sometimes it's not feasible uh, or perhaps even desirable, depending on the pathogen that you are dealing with. So in cases like that, uh, the application of sort of subtyping principles to the analysis of whole genome sequence data can be quite, you know, quite powerful. They're a pragmatic solution uh, when, you know, when proper phylogenetic analysis may not be feasible. Uh, so, you know, but you really need to do a lot of homework to try to do this, uh, you know, in a, in a in a fashion that's likely to work, so it has to be robust and so on and so forth. Oh, I one thing I will say: whole genome-based subtyping. If you're doing your thesis, and and it's a sort of like an inward analysis, um, where you're not really looking to compare your data to everybody else's data and so on, uh, you probably don't have to worry about whole genome subtyping. Where it becomes really important, whole genome subtyping, is not when you start thinking about surveillance and global surveillance. Because this is the sort of thing that makes it possible for your data to talk to my data.
in terms of MLST, again, I wasn't a big fan, but I'm more of a recent convert. Um, and the pros is that, uh, you know, it's good when you have a lot of recombination. And now that we have whole genome sequence data, we can do that, you know, the analysis with thousands of loci as opposed to seven. Uh, and it is the approach currently being used for the analysis of uh, global genomic surveillance data for, for a handful of uh, really important pathogens. But, you know, as I mentioned, uh, if, um, you know, if uh, you have a highly clonal uh, organism, you know, MLST is probably not going to help you because everybody is going to look the same. Um, you also need a schema. Uh, in the lab, we're actually going to go through a bit of an ad hoc schema creation process. But normally, you would actually want to use something like Chewbacca to develop a proper schema. Um, and, and I can't s stress this enough. It gen this generally works better as a hybrid approach where you can use the whole genome subtyping to get you to clones. And that once you start wanting to probe those clones, you can uh, approach it through SNBs and so on. So after the break, we're going to have a lab where we're going to use our studio and a bespoke analysis workflow that we've developed uh, for this uh, for this course, uh, where we're going to take you through the various steps of uh, going from uh, cleaning up data, clustering data, visualizing dendrograms, and so on. Uh, and, and my personal favorite, which is extracting genomic clusters and analyzing those. So uh, thank you for your attention. And after the break, well, we're now in a coffee break.